We're very fortunate to have Fred Dennehy with us, and I'd like to briefly introduce him, although you probably all know him. And at age 61, while still a practicing lawyer, Fred, almost by accident, he said, and maybe we can investigate that later in the evening, what that accident was about. He stepped onto a stage for the first time. And since that moment, of destiny, he has be performed some 50 times in nearly 20 Shakespeare plays and also a number of contemporary shows and some of his own work. Now, when I started to talk to Fred about putting this evening together, we first thought since Fred does acting and playwriting, we could talk about both. But then as it evolved, it seemed like it would be better to put the emphasis on what we're calling the actor's process and, and hopefully save the playwriting part for later in the season. So maybe we can get Fred back for that. But let me just say in regards to the actor's process um, that this isn't, this isn't going to be an evening about a canonical approach to acting. As I just said in my introduction, Fred, Fred uh, is a was a practicing lawyer, quite successful, and almost by accident got into, into acting. But that is very significant and of great interest to our section, that he comes to it as a true amateur, that is, from the heart. And so Fred's going to speak to us this evening from that perspective, rather than out of any general precepts of acting. Um, and he doesn't have, he's told me he doesn't have any of the training necessary to give that sort of professional presentation, but he's just going to speak as an amateur from the heart. It's his, it will be his own introduction to theatrical performance. Some of the questions he faced, which will be of great interest to us, I think, as poets and writers, artists generally, and how the process, most importantly, reoriented his biography. So having said that in introduction, let me pass the evening over to Fred. Fred, take it away. And remember, be mindful of the sound and maybe mute yourself, others. <laughs> okay, thank you, Fred. Thanks, Bruce. As, as I had mentioned to Bruce about 15 minutes ago, I am in the process of getting over a cold but I'm, I haven't gotten over the cough, so I can predict with pretty good accuracy that I'm going to punctuate this talk with a lot of <coughs> coughing, the kind of thing I dread to hear from audiences when I'm performing. But the show must go on, and uh, I'm eager to do this. As Bruce said, this is going to be a presentation about my own experience in community theater over the last 14 years, about questions and challenges that have come up for me. And as he said, when I was 61, I stepped out onto the stage for the first time. And when I was 69, I wrote my first play. I'd always loved the arts, especially literature. And I studied literature in graduate school and I got a PhD actually in English in 1973. But still, I never expected to be connected with any of the arts on a productive level, especially theater. But what I began 14 years ago opened me to what were, for me, new ways of understanding and even new ways of being. I still had an active, very active law practice when I began acting. I was general counsel to a very large firm. And people who saw me doing both would ask me if my experience as a lawyer had helped me in acting. The answer is no. But the reverse is true. Being on the stage definitely helped me in court, particularly in oral argument. Judges told me so. I saw stories and dramatic moments in the law, and I communicated them. Now, I'd been involved with anthroposophy all this time, and I knew about Rudolf Steiner's mystery dramas, 
and my own and his strong interest in the theater. And I was generally aware of the method of acting taught by his pupil, Michael Chekhov, but everything for me came late and I never found time to take a course. I wish I had. So even though I'll mention them, I can't speak with any authority about Michael Chekhov and his method. In, in fact, given my background, I can't speak with much authority about acting at all. What I can speak about is what acting and working with arts later in life has been like for me. And as Bruce said, maybe another time, what playwriting has been like. So <clears throat> on a Sunday morning about 14 years ago, while I was still very much a full-time attorney, I was sitting on the patio with my daughter. And my daughter was reading a local newspaper that features community events. And she said, hey, dad, they're having auditions around here for arsenic and old lace. There's gotta be a lot of parts for old guys in that. I said, right, and I didn't think any more of it. I'd never been on a stage, I'd never acted, not in college, not in high school, nowhere. The closest I'd come was acting out The Grinch Who Stole Christmas for my kids on Christmas Eve and reading Dickens novels with my wife on long car trips. When she was driving, I'd read and I'd take the parts and voices of all the characters in whatever story it was. So I didn't have the slightest idea that day of adding to my schedule as general counsel with a side career in theater. Now, my wife and I were going that afternoon to a local performance of The Merchant of Venice. And when it was over, my wife said that uh, she'd like to drive back. I was talking about the play, so I, I didn't notice that she was going back a different way. Turned out she'd schemed with my daughter and my wife drove me to the audition. So I was there. I did the reading and that night I got a call from the director offering me the part of Mr. Witherspoon, the director of the insane asylum in Arsenic and Old Lace. I took the part, I performed the role and I got hooked. Since then, I have been in more than 50 plays, um, a whole number of Shakespeare plays, some more contemporary ones, some by new authors, uh, anything but musicals. <clears throat> I thought it might be helpful to talk about the rehearsal process in community theater, what it's like. Now, community theater is local municipal playhouses that have a season generally of five or six plays that run three or four weeks. I've worked in about eight of those theaters, as well as a few in New York City, but there only as a playwright. In community theater, there's typically about seven to eight weeks between auditions and opening night. And auditions are very important. Directors typically tell you that casting is anywhere from 50 to 90% of the success of the show. I don't know how you can quantify that, but that's what they invariably say. And then after the audition and the casting, the next point in the process is usually what they call a table reading. So the cast sits around a table, if there's a big enough one, and, and reads through the script. Uh, sometimes the director asks questions about character and motivation. The point of the table reading is to give the director and the cast a feel of themselves in the play as a whole. <clears throat> then rehearsal begins. And the first round of rehearsals typically focuses on blocking. That's where the director tells the actors where he wants them entering, moving around on stage and exiting. And at this point in the process, actors will typically be making choices, physical choices, including gestures and verbal choices of expression. So where and how you look when you speak, what you emphasize, what accent you have if you have one, Usually this is where the actor goes big. She tries out whatever seems good and the director either goes with it or suggests something else. And it's generally very collaborative. In those first weeks of rehearsal, the actors are on stage with scripts in hand. They haven't learned their lines yet. What I found out quickly is that the best actors know their lines as soon as possible. The reason is, you can't begin to use your imagination on stage until you have your hands free and you're not mentally reaching out for the next few words when your character is speaking to other characters. You can't act as the character you're creating when what you're really doing is trying to remember what you're supposed to say and remember it accurately. 
that's trying to act, not playing your character. So it, it's only when what you say is coming naturally and your attention then focuses on what it is your scene partner is saying and meaning. Up to then, you've probably had a set idea of how your character will behave and react. But when you really listen for the first time to what your scene partner's character is saying and feeling, everything can change. And that's when the best part of acting happens. When the character that you've created starts interacting with the character your partner has created. When things happen that you haven't planned. When, when the whole scene can take a form that's completely different from what you expected. And that can happen late in the rehearsal process or early in performance or not at all. But when it does happen, it's white magic. It, it clears the path for what's living and for what's real. You've been something, been through something completely surprising with the partner you're working with, and it makes a connection. And not just for the run, usually a real friendship. Um, I'll, I'll say another thing about um, dealings when you're working together on a production, with very few exceptions, they're very good. Cultural differences, the red-blue thing doesn't really surface. Selfishness, for the most part, takes a holiday, at least in community theater. So back to the process. The director will usually give you a date certain when you have to know your lines. Now, if you forget your lines after that date, you have to call out line and somebody reads it to you from the script. And then the next rehearsal after that, you can't even call for your lines anymore. You have to get yourself out of any mem memory problem or rely on your scene partners to help do it for you. So then the week before you open, there's tech week. That's when the scenes are coordinated with the sound and the light lighting. It's, it's often the first time that you and the others in the cast are in costume. Actors generally hate tech week. For one reason, because they're waiting around for long periods of time while the technical operators coordinate. But the other reason is that it very often throws them off their game. When you memorize your lines, your etheric body is active. The part of you that's concerned with rhythms, with unconscious movements, with muscle memory, all comes into play. You've been saying your lines up to then in a certain pattern, but without sound effects, lights, or distracting costumes all around you. Now all that has changed and you find suddenly that you're dropping lines or blanking on certain phrases. And worse yet, your director may decide at the last minute that he has to change the blocking. Oh, she's gonna be on the other side of you for that scene, it's no big deal. Except it is a big deal. His verbal memory is connected deeply with position and movement. And memory in a performance is a very delicate thing. Okay, so. It's opening night, you've rehearsed the play nearly every night for the last two weeks. You understand your character or you think you do, but tonight you have to go out in front of 200 people. Every actor has experienced stage fright. Laurence Olivier, Meryl Streep, Al Pacino, everybody. The worst case I ever heard of happened to one of the best actors of the last 50 years. His name is Ian Holm. You might remember him as Bilbo Baggins in the film Lord of the Rings, or as the android double agent Ash in Alien, or as the coach Sam Musambini in Chariots, Chariots of Fire. And there's a reason that you remember him from films. Ian Holm was considered one of the best stage actors of his generation. And in 1976, he was playing Hickey, that's the central character in Eugene O'Neill's play, The Iceman Cometh. The Iceman Cometh is five hours long, four in the cut version. And Hickey doesn't come on stage at all for about an hour. So it's, it's a role that's all but engineered for anxiety. Now, Holm had already performed it at least once before a live audience, but at the second preview, the play had been running for well over an hour, and just after Holm actually made his entrance, he suddenly walked off the stage and into his dressing room. 
and he didn't come back to the stage for about 20 years. By the way, when he did return, he decided to play King Lear, and he was reportedly brilliant at it. Now, he made films after he left the stage in 1976, and they were award-winning films, but films are a different medium. If you can't remember your lines, there's always another take. Uh, Daniel Day-Lewis did the same thing during a performance at the end of a very good run of Hamlet in 1989. He just walked off the stage. Now, he's won award after award for his film work since, but he hasn't gone back to live theater. What happened to both of them, of course, was stage fright. The fear of not knowing your lines and even more of not knowing to do with yourself, what to do with yourself on stage. The blood drains from your head and your mind goes blank. You feel in the moment, but in an utterly terrifying way, alone, and time slows down and almost stops. You need a friend. Now, there's one actor I know personally, he's a very high caliber professional. He's been nominated for Tony Awards and he's won some Emmy Awards. And he was on the stage once with another top professional on Broadway when the other guy came up noise, noiselessly next to him and said in a low voice, I don't know what play this is. I don't know where I am. So my friend on stage actually took him by the hand and told him, just stay with me. Stage fright went away in time. So it, it can happen when you're waiting to go on stage or when you first step on stage or in the middle of a scene. It happened to me once when I was playing Prospero in The Tempest. If you know the play, you know that in act one, scene two, Prospero is giving an exposition of the entire background of the play to his daughter, Miranda. It's a very long exposition, and it's basically Prospero giving hundreds of lines of monologue punctuated a few times by Miranda's, oh, the heavens, uh, or your tale, sir, would cure deafness. I always dreaded that part of the play because the lines are really difficult, and they don't have what I'd call the necessity of so much of Shakespeare. But this one time I noticed, hey, it's going pretty well. And I just took one half of a second to enjoy it. And then it started to unravel. I had no idea where I was in the exposition. My Miranda couldn't do much for me because it's not really a dialogue. But eventually she said something like, uh, Father, what did I do when your treacherous brother cast us adrift? And that triggered the line that I remembered, oh, a cherubim thou wast that didst preserve me. And I was back in the scene and in the rhythm of the lines. Why does stage fright happen? Well, Georg Kulevind, uh, who I studied with for a long time, he was very close friends with some actors in Europe. And he spoke a lot about stage fright. He said that the reason was divided attention. We are our attention. And when our attention is directed to the effect and the consequences of our activity and not to the activity itself, the eye is torn and the activity comes apart. Now, actors who suffer from stage fright are not your stereotypical egotists and nobody thinks they are still, Georg said, stage fright is always a symptom of the larger problem of egotism. It happens because at a given moment, maybe just for a moment, an actor is concerned with himself. Will it go well? Will it be a success? And not with what he's doing. Attention or concentration is key. Creativity is possible only in a state of concentration, loose, uncramped, but fully attentive to the work. Everything that compromises attention without exception detracts from creativity. If our attention is divided by self-concern, we can't perform. And incidentally, we can't know the real pleasures of creation. All right, so once again, it's important to me to make clear that I have no academic or workshop background at all in dramatic theory. But most of the community theater directors I've worked with 
did know something about acting theory and tried to pass some part of it on to me. The acting teacher who I heard most about when I started out from directors and from other actors was Konstantin Stanislavski. Stanislavski was, was a genius and his teachings were always evolving. But one part of his technique that was drilled into me by my earliest directors was his system of objectives. And this was the core of it. Everything in a play is done in order to achieve a want of some kind. And that gets resolved into the formula, objective, what do I want? Action, what do I do to get it? Obstacle, what stands in my way? So there are inner actions, which I use on myself, and outer actions, which I use on others. Inner obstacles, my problems, and outer obstacles, the problem of other people. And there are individual objectives and a super objective, the whole thrust of the character in the whole world of the play. Now, this may sound like making a formal system of the very, very obvious. But it's easy for an actor starting out to get completely lost on stage in a maze of possibilities. And it's genuinely helpful to have something clear and authentic to fall back on. It's a great remedy for indecisiveness, which looks dreadful on stage. Unless, of course, you're trying to represent exactly that, unless you're playing Hamlet. But the people who were talking about Stanislavski to me we're usually talking about his method of psychological realism or naturalism. Basically, it's the belief that you can represent your character on stage by experiencing that character's emotions in real time. You can do that by using emotional memory, a technique where you call on your own memory of a past emotion that you've experienced yourself that's similar to what you understand your character's emotion to be. So you're feeling that old emotion as you recite the lines. And that emotion and the sensations that go along with it are even more of a guide for you than, than even your script. You merge with your character. This is the reason behind stories you've probably heard about method actors behaving like their characters, even wearing their costumes off stage at home, at the store. Uh, as well as when they're on the stage. Um, for, for reasons I'll, I'll get into later, I, I did not, I didn't take this on as a way of doing a character myself. But I admire it in, in many cases. Naturalism seems to me to work best in film. And one of the finest examples of naturalistic acting you can ever see is the movie 12 Angry Men from 1957. Whatever you think about the plot and the credibility, the acting is uniformly brilliant. There were 12 actors, 11 of whom were based primarily in New York, the capital of method acting. And in a movie that's meant precisely to draw you into the real situation of a jury room, you see 12 men you know, you've seen these guys before. They don't speak in anything you'd call high language, but they each have at least one moment and they know how to use it to build this recognizable character into an unforgettable creation. Now, from what I understand, Stanislavski developed his method in part as a reaction against a style of acting that had become to a large extent dishonest and false. The most famous actors of the 19th century on British and American stages, typically Shakespearean actors, were actors, you might say, in the grand style. Their voices were magnificent. Their gestures were extravagant. The famous soliloquies were their moments on stage. And they were actually given encores, like the singers of arias in an opera. They must have been something to see and hear. But that style has a tendency to downplay and even to trivialize context. When to be or not to be or our revels now have ended become set pieces, which they were never intended to be by Shakespeare, they simply don't make sense the way they were meant to make sense within the play. 
and performing them like a solo act hurts the play as a whole and incidentally hurts the speech itself. Worse yet, other less talented actors would imitate them. So you had all the excesses that the character Hamlet speaks about in the player's scene with performers bellowing like the town crier and sawing the air with their hands, in short, acting like a ham. Now, community theater actors who take on their first Shakespeare role pretty often fall into this dated style. A little bit of psychological realism and emotional truth can serve them as a good corrective. But the problem with naturalism is that it gets boring. Run-of-the-mill naturalistic work on the part of the actor really makes the audience feel neglected. What they see doesn't engage their imaginations. And that's because it doesn't engage the imaginations of the actors. And so the audience becomes starved for powerful sensations. And they get those sensations instead from the shock of technical effects or from the energy of musicals or maybe the nostalgia of the old chestnuts. So Stanislavski found that the best way to reach truth in acting was from the actor's own personal experience or childhood experiences, adolescent experiences, whatever was strongest. So in, in a sense, the analog of that method is Freudian. But there was another teacher from the Moscow Art Theater who took the method of Stanislavski in a different direction, and that's Michael Chekhov. He was the nephew of the playwright, Anton Chekhov, and Michael was one of the greatest actors of his generation, very definitely, and an even greater teacher. He'd studied at the Moscow Art Theater in the early part of the 20th century under Stanislavski, and Stanislavski reportedly considered him his greatest pupil. But Chekhov eventually went well beyond his teacher, and although he, he always revered Stanislavski, he took a different path. For one thing, he became an anthroposophist, and developed a personal relationship with Rudolf Steiner. Chekhov was convinced, and he taught his students, that imagination, the world of images, was the key not only to acting, but to all art. It's objective. It comes from the spiritual world. So it never loses its power. It's all about delight in invention. It's like the play of children. If there's an analog for the Chekhov work, it's the fairy tale. All plays the way he saw it aspire to the condition of fairy tales. And constant reliance on autobiography, on personal experience, on past emotions, he believed, would lead to degeneration in talent and stagnation in performance. At the extreme, an actor could end up playing himself in every role. Some did. For Chekhov, what inspires the creation is not what is, but what could be. Not the actual, but the possible. The inner life of the character is unbounded and real. You should never impose your personal and unvarying mannerisms on the character. Otherwise, you're imprisoning yourself and you forfeit your originality and your freedom. Chekhov had, had a holistic Gertian approach. If you had a real grasp of even one phrase or one gesture of your character, you had at least potentially access to all the rest. Everything else would fall into place. And that sense, as I understand it, was the origin of what Chekhov is most known for, the psychological gesture, a strong, powerful gesture you try to construct at the beginning of working with the role. That gesture would embody the essence of the character, and to work with it would awaken the character into life. It would awaken the will of the actor to portray that particular character, and it could evolve into hundreds of varieties of that archetypal gesture that you could employ on stage. Now, for my own part in acting, most of the roles, for most of the roles I played, I had a great deal of difficulty experimenting with, with the emotional memory technique. I found that I couldn't authentically attach my character to a past emotion. 
it just wouldn't work. The characters I played, now, a, a lot of them, but not all of them, Shakespearean, the characters were too complex to be circumscribed by a distinct feeling or orientation. Prospero, for instance, is both tyrannical and benevolent. So is old Capulet in Romeo and Juliet. Polonius is both calculating and embarrassingly transparent. Shylock and King Lear and Hamlet are even more complex. Part of playing a difficult or villainous character from the inside is the understanding you get without any doubt that no character in theater or in life is unidimensional. No character can be pinned down with a single label emotion. It's easier to play a character in a single direction, but it's wrong. Now, there's sometimes an extra dimension in a character that's not entirely captured in the script. Polonius, for instance, he, he's gonna die after act three and a number of the surviving characters truly grieve for him. There has to be an aspect of his portrayal that justifies their grief. So the way of creating a character that I edged into was through imagination, text, and language. The other device that I try to employ is, if not the psychological gesture itself, some recurring gesture that in some way epitomizes the character in his scene. I recently played Freud, for instance, as a witness in a trial, Sigmund Freud, and I would use my handkerchief to wipe my glasses uh, every time I listened to the attorney's questions. Um, but because I, I'm personally more tuned into the hearing sense than the visual sense, the gesture I try to use most often to build a character is, is something to do with language, accent, rhythm of speech, maybe a stammer or fixation on a particular word. That's how I do it. Now, Bruce had asked me to do a monologue. And as you can hear, I have a cold, but I'm, I'm happy to give it a shot. Um, the monologue I, I'd like to do is from Hamlet, act two, scene two. I'd be playing Polonius. Now, Gertrude and Claudius are worried about Hamlet's behavior. And the fear is that it's because of their over hasty marriage. And, and Gertrude feels very guilty about that. Um, Claudius doesn't feel guilty at all, but he wants Gertrude to be happy. Now, Polonius is what, the counselor to the king, and of course, he's the father of Hamlet's love interest, Ophelia. He has another explanation. He says Hamlet is depressed because he, Polonius, has barred Ophelia from him. It's wrong, he tells his daughter, for her to entertain a marriage to someone that much above her station. So by convincing Claudius and Gertrude that it's love and not his reaction against their marriage, he actually makes that marriage and his own increase in station more likely. So this is in one sense, a very calculating monologue. He wants to convince them, but he can barely move past the words he needs to do it because that's his personality. He can't focus his attention. Every time he starts saying something, he, he just goes off into left field. So, in, in the monologue I'm going to be doing, um, Polonius sees both Gertrude and, um, and uh, Claudius in secret. My liege, madam, to expostulate what majesty should be, what duty is, why day is day, night night, and uh, time is time, would to be nothing but to waste night, day, and time. It, therefore, since brevity is the soul of wit, and uh, tediousness the limbs and outward flourishes, I will be brief. 
your noble son is mad. Uh, mad call I it, for to define true madness, what is to be nothing else but mad. <laughs> but let that go. Madam, I, I swear I use no art at all. That oh, is mad, tis true. Tis true, tis pity, and uh, <laughs> pity tis, tis true. A uh, foolish figure, but farewell it, for I shall use no art. Mad, let us grant him then. It now remains that we find out the cause of this effect, or rather say the cause of this defect, since this effect Defective comes by cause. And thus it remains, and uh, the remainder thus. <laughs> Perpend, I have a daughter, half <laughs> she is mine, who in her duty and obedience, Mark, hath given me this. Now gather and surmise. <laughs> to the celestial and my soul's idol, the most Beautified Ophelia. Oh, that's an ill phrase. A vile phrase. Beautified it, it, it is a vile phrase. It, it, but, but you shall hear. Good, good madam, stay a while. I, I will be faithful. <clears throat> Doubt thou the stars are fire. Doubt thou the sun doth move. Doubt truth to be a liar. But never doubt I love. Oh, dear Ophelia, I am ill at these numbers. I have not aught to reckon my groans, but that I love thee best, oh, most best, believe it, adieu. Thine evermore, most dear lady, whilst this machine is to him. Hamlet. <laughs> what might you think when I had seen this hot love on the wing? If I had looked upon this love with idle sight, what might you think? No, I went round to work, and my young mistress thus did I bespeak. Lord Hamlet is a prince out of thy star. This must not be. And then I precepts gave her that she should lock herself from his resort, admit no messengers, receive no tokens, this done, she took the fruits of my advice, and he, repulsed, fell into a sadness, then to a fast, thence to a watch, thence to a, a weakness, and then to a lightness, and by this declension, into the madness wherein now he raves, and all we mourn for. Mm -hmm.